Hi, welcome everyone. Um, welcome friends, as we say in the world of Quakers. Uh, my name's Ryan Burley. I'm the curator at the Rose Valley Museum at Thunderbird Lodge. Um, we have a group of friends from Darby, um, Darby meeting. These are real live Quakers <laughs> in the 21st century. And um, Emily, Orla, Lizzie, my partner, and Harold. And you'll be hearing a little more from Harold in a few minutes. So we're, we're here uh, representing Darby meeting, of course, but just Quakerism in general to tell you a little bit about the Quaker story here in this region, as well as touch on some of the Lenape heritage. Um, and there's a handout at the end, uh, which you can take to learn a little bit more. Make sure you have a chance to look at some of the slides presented before you head to your next uh, destination along the trail. So I'll hand it over uh, to Harold. So what I'm gonna do today is give you a brief the briefest of overviews of what are Quakers, because I'm guessing that most people don't know unless they think Quaker, they think motor oil, or they think oatmeal, right? So they're a religious group that grew up in the 1650s in England in response to the chaos of their 10 year long civil war. So what are their beliefs? Well, they were strict Christians uh, following the teachings of Jesus, and they couldn't understand why two Christian groups, the Protestants and Catholics, were killing each other, okay? So they believed that they had a shared purpose, and that was to model an alternative way to have a society, okay? Uh, and challenge others to act the same. Uh, they believe that God communicates directly with people, and you do not need the aid of ordained clergy. So the Quakers did not have ordained clergy. Uh, they believed that people don't need churches, rituals, sacraments, holy days to practice their religion. Rather, the religion is something that you should exude in your everyday life, right? You should practice what you preach. Don't just save it for Sunday. Uh, and finally, worship is silent until someone feels moved to get up and speak. Yeah. Okay. So early Quaker values are four pretty simple. Simplicity, you should only use the resources that you need so that other people have resources too. And it's important when you spend money to spend money in a wise way that's to the benefit of the community. Secondly, uh, is the testimony to truth, that one should live and promote and act in truthfulness and with integrity. And you should not be afraid to challenge people in positions of power to act with integrity too, right? Finally, the testimony to equality, uh, and that idea is that the light of God is in everyone, therefore we are equal. And finally, the testimony to peace, that nonviolent confrontation is always superior than going to war. Okay, problem is that England is based on a hierarchy, okay? in which the top 1% own 35% of everything, the top 8% own 90% of everything, and the bottom 92% own just 10%. Sound familiar? Okay. So, as a result, the Quakers who went around preaching their philosophy were seen as heretics and troublemakers by the people at the top of the pyramid. Okay, so enter this guy, William Penn. So William Penn grew up as an Anglican, and he experienced the Civil War, and he was repelled by it. Uh, he came upon the teachings uh, of the Religious Society of Friends and joined by age 22. I think it's important that you know that he was the son of the Admiral of the... We're going right there now, okay? <laughs> so, <clears throat> the king, here's the king, okay? See, look. <laughs> okay, so the king had borrowed a lot of money from William Penn's father, who was a admiral. And in those days, when you uh, basically captured a foreign ship, you got to keep it. So you made a lot of money. Uh, anyway, so he, uh, William Penn's father, had lent the king a lot of money to persecute the war. And when he died in 1680, 
uh, William Penn went to collect because he had to pay the debtors of his father. Okay, so the king had an idea because he didn't have any money, but he had an idea, and that is, that I'm, how about this? How about if I give you land in this place called something in America, yeah. North America, it's kind of around Delaware and New Jersey, in exchange for the debt that I owe your father, okay? And you can take all your friends and go there. So that was the plan to get rid of the troublesome Quakers. Okay, so William Penn, he <coughs> turned around and what he did is he um, sold this to the Quakers on the idea that we're gonna have a quote, holy experiment, which will be a government based on Christianity and the Quaker values. That, that was the whole idea. So Pennsylvania was set up to be an intentional community. So think about that. Mm -hmm. Like Rose Valley was supposed to be an intentional community. But wasn't it the first place that allowed people of any other religion to come? We're getting there. Okay. We're getting there. <laughs> We're getting there. All right. Oh. All right. Well, I, I, you can grade me when I'm done. All right. All right. So core ideas is simplicity, truth, equality, and peace and the golden rule, right? So here we go. Key features of the holy experiment, a new approach to government. We're gonna let people have a say. Well, it's not gonna be everybody, it's just gonna be white guys, because we've seen women drive, so we know the answer there, okay? No military, which was unheard of. You're laughing, your wife's gonna be mad at you. Uh, yeah, next, freedom of religion, which was unheard of, unique for the era. In those days, whatever the religion of the king was, you had to follow, okay? Uh, enlightened penal code. Prison is gonna be about reform, not punishment, okay? Next, jobs for everybody, okay? Next, <clears throat> we're gonna have education for everybody, even women, okay? And Town planning for healthy living, one of every 10 acres is set aside for green space, right? And finally, a commonwealth that uh, nature's resources belong to who? Nature. Everybody, Everybody. commonwealth, right? Commonwealth. To everybody. Not just, oh, there's oil in your land, so you get the resources. No, it's, everybody. right, everybody. Okay, so finally, uh, fair treatment of native peoples and previous colonists. Okay, so that's the plan, and here's how it's going to go. There's going to be one colony. Uh, the Welsh wanted to have their own thing, and they said, no, one colony here. And Penn is the proprietor. There are three counties. Bonus points for people that know the, who are the three original counties. Okay. Chester. Chestershire, right? Bucks. Bucks. Philadelphia. Okay. Was Bucks named after... Buckinghamshire, okay? But that's too long to say, so we just go to Bucks, right? Okay, so how then each county is subdivided into townships. And in the beginning, each township has one meeting, and that meeting is also the government for that township, the green dots, right? So here's a, a map of what it looked like in 1690, and you can check that out. Okay, so uh, Penn didn't show up until October 27th of 1862. 1682. He, sorry, 1682. <laughs> and he wrote it wrong on the thing. Okay, and he showed up in Upland, right, which he renamed Chester because Upland had been the name given by the Swedes who had got here before the English. And by 1700, to give you perspective, 90% of the inhabitants of Chester County were Quakers. Wow, right. So it's here that the first, here being Chester, that the first General Assembly convenes in December and they adopt the great law, a humanitarian code that became the fundamental basis of Pennsylvania law and which guarantees liberty of conscience. This law attracted many non-Quakers and by 1756, they became a political minority, the Quakers, and the holy experiment had failed. That map that's going around has the four different years 
and it will show you the progression of other religious groups that came to settle. Right, so it's kind of interesting. Okay, so uh, down to the end here. So I wanted to talk about Quakers and slavery. And at the founding of the colony, 70% of the Quakers were slaveholders. Mm -hmm. But the, the Quakers that came from Darby were not, and I don't have time to explain that. Uh, that's a whole other presentation. Uh, in 1688, four Quakers in Germantown wrote a letter to their meeting and to the yearly meeting, which is the overarching entity, and said, we don't understand this because the golden rule says, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And I wouldn't want to be a slave, would you? So they're like, please explain this because we're obviously stupid. Um, and of course, this got people thinking because they're like, you know, they're right. So uh, anyway, by 1694, the meetings of our area, which collectively met four times a year in what was called the Chester Quarterly, they counseled their brethren to not be concerned in slaveholding, that slaveholding was inconsistent with their beliefs. Mm -hmm. By 1775, they had convinced all the Quakers in the Philadelphia area, and they said you could either be a slaveholder or a Quaker, but not both. By 1780, the Quakers in government were able to get a law passed in, uh, <clears throat> in the legislature, uh, basically saying that from this point on, any uh, children born of uh, an enslaved person would be a servant until age 28, and then they would be free, and that during that time they must be educated and taught a trade. So this is called gradual manumission, is the word I was looking for. Okay, and final thing is the Quakers uh, in the 1840s basically lamented that they let non-Quakers here and they became a minority. Bye. <laughs> Party on. Let me. Thank you, so thank you Harold. Tremendous. This is our first go around today. Um, I just want, would like to add that there were three Quaker brothers from Cheshire that came on the ship uh, Friendship, uh, the vessel Friendship in 1682. They landed at Upland in August of 1682, and they were given essentially a thousand acres that they divided three ways between the three brothers, uh, Thomas, Randall, and Robert Vernon. So we are in the middle of Robert Vernon's tract, um, just across uh, Ridley Creek. If you come down Old Mill Lane, you see the house that's now called the Bishop White House. That is believed to be Robert Vernon's home. Um, it was expanded upon by Will Price at the turn of the century. And the other two uh, Vernon homes still exist in other parts of Rose Valley. They are the ones that largely settled this area and were responsible for uh, dividing up the land amongst their uh, grandchildren later on post-revolution. So thanks for being here.